Good morning and good afternoon. I'm Dr. Jill Einstein, the Senior Director of Physician Engagement of MAVEN Project, and I welcome you to today's session on dermatology, pediatric dermatology, which is the second in a six-part educational series presented by the Vaseline Healing Project, Direct Relief, and MAVEN Project. Please mark your calendars for the following um, presentations. Um, we're really excited. Our next talk will be a Vaseline Healing Project presentation on eczema on Friday, June 3rd, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern time with Dr. Jeanette Okoye from Howard University. And then following that, um, the next direct relief education session series will be on a clinical approach to opioid addiction on Friday, July 15th. 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern with Dr. Timothy Fong from UCLA. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Anna Yasmin Kerkorian. She's a dermatologist and chief of dermatology at Children's National Hospital. Her interests and expertise include vascular birthmarks, neonatal dermatology, genetic skin disorders, inflammatory skin disorders such as eczema and psoriasis, pigmented lesions like moles, acne and hyperhidrosis, increased sweating. She's an expert in laser and surgical treatments for pediatric dermatology patients. She has published numerous peer reviewed articles and book chapters on topics in pediatric and general dermatology. Dr. Kerkorian grew up in New York City. She obtained her medical degree from the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. She completed her residency training in dermatology at the Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson School of Medicine and her fellowship training in pediatric dermatology at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Welcome Dr. Kerkorian, and I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you and you can share your slides. Okay, thank you. I'm very excited to be here. Um, and thank you very much for that invitation and that kind introduction. I'm going to go ahead and share my slides. Can somebody confirm that you're seeing the slides? Yes, we can see them. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. So the goal of this session is to really be particularly high yield for um, you on the front line, uh, sort of doing primary care, uh, especially if there are resource limitations. I, you know, I want these to be practical and pragmatic tips. So um, as we go through the lecture, definitely please place um, questions in the in the chat and we'll try to get to those um, at the end. And if there's something that's burning, you know, while I'm going through it, I'm happy to pause and take questions in between and maybe Dr. Einstein can pose those. Um, these are my disclosures. They're not really relevant to this talk. So we're going to start with looking at inflammatory skin disorders, primarily atopic dermatitis, as that's the most common inflammatory skin disorder in humans. Um, and then we'll take a uh, sojourn into tinea, which is very important because it's a common mimicker, and finally um, finish up with hemangiomas. So let's start with atopic dermatitis and other eczematous eruptions. So atopic dermatitis, as I mentioned, is the most common inflammatory skin disease in humans. And why that's relevant is not only because how common it is, but also it is extremely lot high impact on quality of life in particular when we're talking about severe atopic dermatitis and yet it has received very little attention until the last couple of years where there's been this explosion in therapeutics um, and this quality of life impact really primarily uh, you know it can affect all ages but it's really borne quite severely by young children and their families so that's what i'm going to be talking about today and eczema is not just a skin disease, but it has this outsized impact on sleep, um, primarily due to itch, but it is also, there are more and more associations being understood now in terms of mood disorders, attention issues, possibly a link to growth, both lack of growth and excessive growth, such as obesity. And then, you know, the un, unknown or the, the impacts that people don't overtly tell you about, such as missing school and work. Um, here's a picture just of a child, an infant with numular Atopic dermatitis, this coin-shaped, more plaque-like atopic derm that often gets mistaken for other diseases. Um, eczema has an, affects many, many children, at least 20% of children, and it has a major impact on the quality of life of the child. I've already said mainly due to itch. That itch that leads to disturbed sleep. Um, and it's not just the child who doesn't sleep, but the classic story is the child sleeps with the parent. The parent holds their hands down so they can't scratch in their sleep, so the parent has disrupted sleep. 
that may lead to the parent having things like car accidents because they're so tired. Um, the child misses school. They may have low self-esteem or be bullied due to the appearance of their skin and more and more data coming out about ADHD and other and mood disorders. But every child lives within a family. So there is this co-sleeping, the parents, um, themselves are getting poor sleep, but also that siblings may feel neglected or may not be able to get as much attention. Lost work days and the enormous financial impact of not just losing work, but also um, the amount of money people spend on products trying to um, help the eczema. So let's talk a little bit now about treatment. So what I often hear as a specialist is that, well, I've tried topical steroids, sorry, and they don't work. Well, before we talk about failure of a topical steroid, we need to actually interrogate what they have actually done. So I have them, ideally they would bring their medications with them half the time or maybe 90% of the time people will say, I tried a cream. They don't know what they tried. They don't know if it's an ointment or cream, what the potency was and so on. So we may need to call the pharmacy. We may need to have them, um, you know, take pictures of their medications. But most of the time when people say they've failed, it's really that they had an inadequate potency of steroid or an inadequate quantity or more commonly both. So um, we need to treat with a sufficient quantity of topical steroid to actually treat the amount of body surface area involved. And we need to treat with a high enough potency steroid. Um, and then the vehicle is very important. We almost never use creams or lotions. We almost always use ointment in children because otherwise it stings. So we want to make sure that it was um, what they were using in terms of potency, quantity, and then um, what class of steroid. Uh, another common misconception is like it's not safe to use steroids in babies. There is no lower age limit for topical steroid use and potency is not restricted based on age. And we can talk about that more. Um, a common, I think, controversial or an idea that people may not have come across as much is that antibiotics have very little role to play in the treatment of atopic dermatitis. Um, even though people with eczema are frequently colonized or even infected with staph bacteria, you have to repair the barrier in order to have the staph no longer be present. So just putting on new pyrocin, not gonna be helpful. I don't use oral antibiotics unless it's a true infection as in pus, pustules, et cetera. And then I'm culturing and treating to the organism, not just guessing. Oral antihistamines, I'm gonna tell you why in the next slide, why I'm not into them. And then of course you need to be always asking certain questions to make sure there aren't other workups. So any child under age one, regardless of the status of their eczema, I'm asking about growth. Um, I'm asking about other findings that might be concerning for failure to thrive or genetic syndrome. So if they are failing to thrive or they have other findings such as frequent infections, um, you know, unusual hair, other anomalies that might suggest a genetic syndrome, then we're gonna be referring. So in any child that comes to me, even who claims to have failed topical steroids, I implement a rescue plan. I wanna show that they actually fail within my hands because in that case, I know I need to go and go on to systemic medications. So we prescribe a one pound jar of triamcinolone ointment. This is extremely cheap, covered by most insurances. If they don't cover the full jar, you can get three 80 gram tubes, but you need a sufficient quantity. It's always gonna be the 0.1%. We never use the 0.025 or the 0.5%. And we do a two week intensive pulse everywhere. This is much easier for patients, especially our patients um, who have, um, you know, lower socioeconomic status may also have issues, not always, but sometimes with medical literacy. So trying to give them complex instructions, 10 different creams in 10 different locations is guaranteeing failure. One medication applied everywhere. Um, and then you want to allow that to soak in. And then you do a thick layer of an emollient. My prefer preferred one is Vaseline ointment and then cotton pajamas, see them back in two weeks. Um, the medication is only applied once a day after the bath, which is daily, and then the moisturizer is multiple times a day. This is very simple, but highly effective. And then the most important part is seeing them back in two weeks, because that's when you can see if it actually worked. Anybody can implement something for two weeks, and then you could talk about maintenance at that next visit. This might be a good time to do a quick pause to see if anybody wants to ask me a question about this rescue plan, because this is maybe the most important thing I can teach you in this whole lecture. Great. Um, let's see. Um, I don't know if, let me just double check in the chat if there was anything here. Um, Dr. Menon, I know you have your um, hand raised. Let me just see if uh, I can allow you to talk if you have a question and if you don't want to, that's okay.
and I can keep going. Okay, okay great. I'll keep going and we can continue at the end if we have questions. So in terms of that two week visit, so you've done the one, the two week rescue, and then you bring them back to your clinic. And what are you going to do to maintain the efficacy at that visit? So um, you may just see that they're much, much better. And perhaps you're just gonna spot treat with topical steroid from then. So it could have just been, they didn't have a sufficient quantity. They didn't understand how to apply the medication, but there are people who will then subsequently flare and you do need to implement maintenance medication. So we do have non-steroid medications that are good options for maintenance. They may, they're marketed often as treatment, but as treatments, they're not as effective in my opinion, but they are quite good for maintenance. So, um, one such drug is Crisaberol, brand name Eucrisa, um, which the benefits of it are it's a non-steroid, it's approved down to three months old, and it's quite occlusive, so it's effective. The really major negatives are that it burns severely with application to active um, eczema, so I do not recommend it as a primary treatment, but as a maintenance, it does not tend to burn. And in the setting of resource limitation, it's quite costly and requires a prior authorization, so um, this is something to take into account. Um, but it should be covered with a prior authorization. Um, topical calcineurin inhibitors, they're the older drugs, still quite effective. Um, that includes tacrolimus and pimecrolimus. They are approved from two uh, plus, two years of age and older, and they're quite good, I think, as maintenance primarily on these sensitive locations, such as the face where you don't want to use chronically ster use steroids chronically. Um, they do carry a black box warning, which has not been shown, which has to do with the risk of lymphoma, though that nobody really believes that that is likely to occur with topical use, but it's based on systemic use of the medication. It's important to know about it, though, because parents may ask, and they also are, are quite uh, costly requiring a prior authorization. Um, but again, they're all covered by um, insurances with that prior authorization. In an uninsured patient, it's a more challenge. The new kit on the blocks, it, block is ruxolitinib cream, Opsilura, which is a topical JAK JAK inhibitor. These are approved for eczema for ages 12 plus. Um, and the, the benefit that's being touted for this is that it may actually be comparable to a steroid in potency, whereas the other drugs are more comparable to a low potency steroid or even just um, an emollient. The downside again is the cost, and this one does carry some safety issues. Um, so that's sort of one that's TBD at this point, primarily in a resource limited setting, that would be challenging to get covered. Dr. Krikorian, two questions. Yes. Um, how long does the steroid need to soak in? Yeah, so I usually say five to 10 minutes. There's no like data on that, but I just use common sense. Like if you were to put an ointment on your skin, how long till it sort of has gone in? So five to 10 minutes so that you're not diluting it out with the topical emollient. And I'm very against the mixture of steroid with an emollient. I often have patients refer to me where the they were told by a different doctor to mix triamcinolone with Vaseline or mix it with CeraVe or something. And I don't really understand the point of that. You're diluting your potency of your medication and you don't know how much you're applying. So medication first, emollient second. Great, and the role of oral prednisone in atopic dermatitis? Oral prednisone should never be used in atopic dermatitis. Why? Because it causes re severe rebound flaring. So when you stop, you, you, know, you look like a hero when you give prednisone because they look great, they feel the best they've ever felt. But when you check back in with them a week after that, they're a disaster. Their skin is severely flaring. So that's one issue. Prednisone is not a harm-free drug. So even intermittent courses of prednisone can have serious adverse effects, short-term effects like severe mood disruption, but even fractures and other issues. And it's not a safe drug as a long-term systemic drug. So there's really no reason for that, especially in the era of systemic medications that are much safer like dupilumab. Um, if you need a rescue drug, my choice, my drug of choice is cyclosporin, um, how, which is cheap too. But in a resource limited setting, if you know that you can get them into a dermatologist who will start dupilumab, it wouldn't be absolutely inappropriate to do prednisone, but it's just really deeply not preferred. And that's not just by me, but according to guidelines published in our literature as well. Um, this is to me a very important slide because I think antihistamines are really overused or abused in the use of treatment of eczema, despite the fact that they don't help. So antihistamines um, are not FDA approved in young babies and they don't really have good evidence in eczema at all, and yet they're prescribed very widely. And I see that my reference has dropped off this slide, so I'll share those um, in the final slides, uh, meaning when you guys get them in a week from now. Uh, sedating antihistamines in particular 
those are the ones that will induce sleep. So they might help you a little bit if you're in a crisis with eczema, but they're not providing durable sleep. So parents will tell you if you ask them, yeah, they maybe fall asleep, but they wake up an hour or two later or four hours later scratching. Um, and so non-sedating antihistamines really don't help at all. Sedating antihistamines maybe help a little bit, but with a cost. So they can cause excessive sedation and with chronic use, they may reduce the seizure threshold. And more importantly than that, I think, is this impact on learning and school performance, which people have documented, um, and possibly even an, an association with later development of ADHD. Now, you can definitely say there's confounders, maybe children with severe eczema and sleep deprivation, that also triggers a risk for ADHD. But the bigger picture is that they don't really help eczema. So if somebody has chronic pruritus from eczema, a, the first step is always treat the skin. Treat the skin properly, and then if that's not working, move on to a systemic medication, um, not just give them hydroxazine for three years. Um, so, and, and the more you talk to patients, the more they'll tell you it doesn't work, and it doesn't work, and it's not good for them. So I've mentioned um, a couple of the new kids on the block, but there's an absolute like explosion of therapeutics in the in the eczema field at this time. And that is due to a lot of work by our scientists who are we're, I'm so thankful for discovering the pathways of inflammation in eczema, which are really quite complex. And the point of this cartoon is not to say like, let's memorize cytokines, but just to understand that because there are so many different pathways of inflammation, that also provides pathways for therapeutic blockade where you can treat the eczema. So the one that um, you surely heard about by now, dupilumab or dupixin, is FDA approved from ages six and older. It blocks IL-4 and IL-13 um, cytokines that are related to this TH2 pathway. But there are many, many others in clinical trials. Um, and we do now have a second drug recently approved for eczema in children, upadacitinib, also called Rimvoke, and that's approved for ages 12 and older. Um, and many more drugs to come. So we have medications now for patients that you know previously didn't exist. So dupilumab is important to know about. As I mentioned, um, it is approved for ages six and older. It's quite safe. We're expecting it to be approved down to actually six months. Um, in theory, we've heard on the grapevine it'll be approved in the next uh, month. We'll see what actually happens. But um, we are able to get it off label under age six um, or on label for six and older at different dosages depending on age and weight. Um, the nice thing about this drug is it's immunomodulatory, not immunosuppressive. So you don't actually have to worry about the immune system. There's no increased risk of infections. Children can be vaccinated. Um, <clears throat> and um, they can get their COVID vaccine, all of the above. Uh, and you don't need any laboratory monitoring. So it's a very attractive drug for children. It can cause some eye inflammation, other side effects. Um, so we discuss those with patients. I'm not going to belabor that during this talk, but it has been a very important life altering drug for our patients. So here's one child, horrendous, severe, parigo-like atopic dermatitis, biopsied numerous times, every workup you could think of, immunology, et cetera, allergy. Um, his life was almost not worth living to him and his family because he was so severely affected, couldn't go to school, um, severe depression, et cetera. We actually um, fought very hard to get him the dupilumab because it was off-label under 12 at that time. Um, here's some more pictures of his horrendous atopic dermatitis. And then we were able to get him to pilumab finally, and you can see he's a changed person. He does have still the lichenification hyperpigmentation, but life altering for him. Um, so when Dr. do we- Oh, sorry, yeah. just a quick question. For the new meds on the block, how mm -hmm. long can patients be on them? And what are your thoughts on a primary care physician or provider starting and managing these types of meds? Okay, so how long can they be on them? Nobody knows the answer to that because they're new drugs. Um, presumably they're going to be on them chronically because eczema is a chronic disease. There are some papers now with people trying to wean off dupilumab after a certain number of years. The patients that we've done that relapsed and we ended up needed to, ended up needing to put them back on. Um, there's really very, very little data about the JAK inhibitors of which upadacitinib is one of them in terms of duration of treatment. So I'm not gonna even talk about that. I don't think at this time it would be appropriate for primary care physicians to do anything with the JAK inhibitors just because they are so new and they have serious adverse effects such as clots, malignancy, and um, immunosuppression. I think dupilumab would be interesting um, in my opinion, it would be great to have primary care physicians prescribing dupilumab who are properly trained because there's no way there's enough dermatologists to see all these patients and you guys are on the front line. It's quite a safe medication. So as long as you 
um, understand the adverse effects, understand how to do injection teaching, which is quite simple. And there's lots of videos from the company and so on. Um, and you understand the time, you know, when it would be appropriate to say a patient has truly failed a first line treatment and you're certain the patient has eczema because in adults, there are mimickers such as cutaneous T-cell lymphoma you wouldn't want to miss. But in children, the vast majority of people with an eczema-like eruption are going to be eczema. I mean, I think it would be reasonable. Um, and it, I, it's interesting to think about and something that it's worth discussing more with the company in terms of whether they're expecting that to be the case. As of now, I'm not aware of primary care physicians um, prescribing dupilumab, but it may be the case that it expands, and I think that would be a good thing. So um, when do we actually consider systemic therapy? So uh, in my mind, you want to have a big net to at least consider it. That's not to say you will do it, but to consider it. So any child with severe atopic dermatitis should at least see a dermatologist once, even if that means driving to a city that's far away because it has such a life impact. Um, so what is severe? If they have extensive body surface area, if they're chronically lichenified with that thickened skin, that means they've been scratching for months, if not years. If their sleep is disturbed by itch more than one to, one to two times per month, but really most people will come in and say weekly, there's, you know, every night or every two nights they wake up from sleep, that that is a, an is, a huge issue. Um, if you've really treated them appropriately with topical steroids in the manner that I described already, and they're still worsening, then we need to think about it. If they're going to the ER or the urgent care due to frequent staph infections, herpes, eczema herpeticum, then they need to be seen. Anybody who's got ER visits or hospitalizations, and then if they're missing school or having bullying, those are all reasons to consider, at least consider the, the systemic medications. This is another child where it's not as severe as the kid I showed you before, but she's got clearly chronic involvement with, as you can see, due to the hypopigmentation. She's got a lot of body surface area involved. She's got excoriations. She's embarrassed to wear her, you know, short sleeve clothing. She's waking up every night from sleep and she's an appropriate candidate for dupilumab. Okay, so we're gonna switch gears now and get into a few cases. So this is a child who comes in with a foot rash. She's an eight year old. She keeps getting this rash on her feet. It cracks and fissures. And she was thought to have tinea pedis, um, athlete's foot. And so she was treated with some topical clotrimazole, which didn't work. Um, and her mom mentions, well, she's always been really, really sweaty. Um, what do you think this could be doctor? So um, what do you guys think? Would you like to put in um, a potential Diagnosis. That's great. Feel free to type into the chat. We'll just give you um, a few seconds to go ahead and do that. But we'd love to get your guys' input into what you, you think. So I see someone mentioned dyshydrotic eczema, um, hand status post hand, foot, and mouth, which is a good um, good thought that I'll comment on. Dyshydrotic eczema. So um, you could consider this sort of in the family of dyshydrosis, but dyshydrosis doesn't really happen in children and looks more like little tapioca bubbles under the skin rather than this fissured cracking. But to be, in my opinion, they're on a spectrum, these two disorders. Um, this diagnosis is actually called juvenile plantar dermatosis or sweaty sock syndrome. But basically, it's a barrier dysfunction related to both having sensitive skin and being constantly in moisture, and dyshydrosis is very similar. I do want to comment on the hand, foot, and mouth. I think that was a very nice point to bring up, which is to say that not in this scenario where we're talking about a chronic disorder, but somebody who's had severe hand, foot, and mouth can have acral peeling even for weeks or months afterwards. So absolutely, if you had a history of having had severe hand, foot, and mouth, um, and it's more peeling rather than the cracking, um, hand, foot, and mouth would be a reasonable, like post hand, foot, and mouth peeling would be a reasonable possibility. Um, so juvenile plantar dermatosis, also called sweaty sock syndrome, is due to an abrupt change from that wet sock environment. Um, sorry, um, let's see what's going on here. Uh, to the dry sock free environment. And unlike tinea pedis, you know, you don't see involvement in the toe web. So it's the bottom of the foot and the bottom of the toes, but not in between. And their nails are unaffected, whereas most people with tinea pedis will also have onychomycosis. Um, and it's commonly going to look almost like cracked pottery, very fissured and painful, and you wanna moisturize and also treat them with a high potency topical steroid. 
Um, so the most common mimicker that people think it is is tinea pedis, but it isn't. Uh, another kind of foot rash to be aware of is psoriasis. Um, so I t entitled this section eczematous eruptions, but psoriasis is a psoriasiform, so they look different. Um, but still, they can be scaly fissured rashes on the plantar foot. So if you have someone with a chronic fissuring, it's usually, in the case of psoriasis, more focal, not all over the foot. Although, of course, I have a case here which is very severe um, on the right where you see this very severe case of plantar psoriasis. But if you have this more focal plaques that are fissured or have pustules in them, you want to think about palmo plantar psoriasis as a potential disorder. This is quite a recalcitrant disease, even with high potency steroids like clobetazole, it doesn't necessarily improve. Um, and so therefore you need to send this person to, um, to dermatology. I'm just gonna, I had been on my email because I was getting on the Zoom, so I just wanna get out of that so you don't hear that noise. Give me one moment. Okay, I am back. Here we go. Okay, so um, that is just some examples of palmo, of palmo plantar, in this case, plantar psoriasis. So just a little bit of a comment on psoriasis. Here are some other severe cases I've had. You can see it just focally, like in the umbilicus in this child um, who also has other issues. That's why there's a G-tube, but also quite severely on the lower extremities, more classic plaque psoriasis. So psoriasis is very commonly misdiagnosed. People think, oh, children don't get psoriasis, but they, they do. Um, and, it, and especially if it's involving the face, it can be misdiagnosed as eczema. So we know from experience and now from some publications that facial psoriasis is more common in kids. So if you see more sort of scaly plaques on the eyelids, one of the things it could be in addition to, you know, eczema and contact dermatitis is psoriasis. If you see a child where you think it could be psoriasis, you wanna check the groin and armpits because children often present with what's called inverse psoriasis, psoriasis that's affecting those areas. And the children may not even, the parents may not even know the child has it, even if they're past the age where they're being assisted with toileting, or they might think, oh, they just don't wipe properly if it's a girl or you know that they have a yeast infection, but prepubertal children do not get yeast infections, okay? So that would not make sense. Um, and then if the ear canals are involved, that's very suggestive of psoriasis, the scalp, or if there's pitting in the nails. If they have a family history, that's very helpful, but it's absolutely not necessary. In other words, you can have psoriasis in a child that does not have any family history. And if they have psoriasis, we treat them just like adults. They don't not get medication just because they're a child. So I've seen that on Facebook messaging groups and from parents who've come in, my kid had this for four years, but they told me we can only use cream because they're a child. That is not true. Um, and in fact, drugs are approved for psoriasis in children down to age four, and we can use them off label under age four if necessary. So guttate psoriasis, you may have heard of more common in children, this more raindrop like type of psoriasis. That's what guttate means. And it can be triggered by a streptococcal pharyngitis, but it doesn't have to be. Other infections and viruses can trigger it as well. Um, and whether treatment of the infection helps the psoriasis really doesn't seem to be the case. So usually if you have an infection that triggers the psoriasis, usually you go on to have chronic psoriasis. Um, and this requires treatment as well. Um, so they may be treated topically with phototherapy or systemic medications, depending on the case. That's a little outside of the scope of this lecture. Psoriasis and skin of color can be difficult sometimes to diagnose because you don't have that classic erythema. And erythema and skin of color can look more brown or violaceous and be confusing. So this child was initially diagnosed as eczema, but when you look closely, she has plantar involvement, she has sharply demarcated plaques with scale, she has scalp involvement. Um, this is psoriasis, and she has improved substantially on um, with use of a systemic medication, used to kinumab. Okay, so now we're gonna, we did the feet, let's talk about the hands now. So we have a left-handed child who presents with this rash. She was treated with a low potency steroid, which didn't help. So what do we think the cause of this rash is? What is the diagnosis? If you wanna go ahead and put that in the chat. I'm trying to see if anyone's written anything. So I see someone mention Raynaud's, psoriasis. Scabies. Okay. 
irritant. So I have some really good thoughts here. So um, Raynaud's, I would say, um, is a good thought because it's always good to think about differential diagnoses based on the location. However, it generally will be episodic. You know, you go through your um, three color phases and more distal um, and associated with cold. So the prompt doesn't really necessarily fit with that or the more proximal involvement, but good to think of in the hands. Psoriasis is always a good thought with a scaly eruption on the, on the hands and feet. Um, scabies, again, you can have definitely, um, if you have burrows, especially acral surfaces, um, but I was hoping at the, by mentioning left-handed that I would trigger you to think of something external. So why handedness would matter. So irritant and contact derm is exactly sort of the direction I wanted to go with this. So when you have an asymmetrical eruption or an eruption that's strangely shaped, you always want to think about, is this an inside job, an internal rash like psoriasis or eczema, or is this a, what dermatologists call an outside job? An outside job is some external stimulus that triggers it. So this is an outside job. This is in fact, allergic contact dermatitis, but but um, irritant contact can look very similar, so good thoughts. Um, in this case, this is allergic contact dermatitis to slime. So slime is this play substance. If you're a parent, you dread this thing because it messes up your whole house. But basically, it's a, a kind of a played play substance, like a goopy thing that they play with. And it's made from all kinds of different products that can cause contact dermatitis. Um, and slime is not the point of the lecture. The point of the lecture of, the, of this topic is to say, anytime you have a weird pattern, what is this person touching? It, whether it be their face, their genitals, their hands, their knees, if it's a strange pattern, you wanna think about a contact allergen. And in children on the hand, slime was a you know really common contact allergen when it was in a, a big popular um, thing to play with. Now, this is another example of an of a, outside job, but in this case, it's an irritant rather than an allergic contact dermatitis. So when you have this hyperpigmented scaly eruption immediately around the lips, this is lip licking dermatitis. So that's an irritant dermatitis from saliva. Um, and they can also have an allergic contact. So usually you get dry because you licked your lips too much, and then you start putting stuff all over it. So you might put some chapstick, some lip balm, some lip gloss, and then you become allergic to that and you get a contact dermatitis to those. So you wanna really, whenever I'm seeing patients where I'm suspecting contact dermatitis irritant or allergic, you really need to interrogate exhaustively, like what are you putting on? And you go through it hundreds of times till you really get to it. Um, if you suspect contact dermatitis, you wanna refer for patch testing if you can't figure out the allergen, um, although that's not very easy to do if you don't have a patch tester nearby. So it's easier to just eliminate products. If it's a chronic lip licking to the, that they cannot stop, then you need to work with psychology for habit reversal. So allergic contact, so I just wanna make sure we understand the difference. So irritant contact dermatitis is where you have um, a non-immunologic non irritation. So whether it's soap, wipes, or whatever, you get irritated by rubbing your hands, you know, or, or having the product on you like a soap, and anybody would have the same irritation. It doesn't require an immune response. An allergic contact dermatitis is a specific immunologic response. The T cells are sensitized to a specific allergen. It's unique to that individual. And then they are going to get worse and worse with each exposure. Their classic example is poison ivy, but any personal care products or other things, nickel, there's many different allergens that can cause it. So one, um, there was a big um, explosion in contact dermatitis to wipes, wipes that are you know used to, to like diaper wipes, but people use them on their hands, on their face. Um, and this was a classic publication in pediatrics that I took this photo from where this child had this really recalcitrant perioral dermatitis. And then they found out she was using, they were using wipes to wipe the face. They, they patch tested her, discovered it was an allergy to a preservative in the wipe, stopped the wipes and she recovered. So it's super duper important to identify this because there is no steroid that can stop your immune system from reacting if you keep having systemic exposure, you know, topical exposure. So you really have to stop the allergen as the primary um, response as well as using topical steroids to heal the barrier. Um, people can be allergic to aquaphor, I'm sorry, to lanolin, which is an aquaphor and many other products, to preservatives like my, um, MCIMI, which have a super long name that um, is hard to say, um, methyl chloroisothalazone. Lip care products I mentioned, even vaping, so to the like devices you use to vape or the vaping products themselves. So it can be even things that a patient wouldn't tell you about. Um, and if you can't figure it out, that's when you need to patch test if possible. And patch testing is different from prick testing that allergists do. 
Dr. Kaporian, oh, yes. oh, sorry, just a quick question. No, this was from about five minutes ago, so I'm not sure, sure where we were at, but um, thoughts on combo cream steroid and anti plus antifungal? Yeah, that's another never situation. So dermatologists hate those um, because you're really, you're kind of like hamstringing yourself. If it's a fungus, you make it worse with a steroid. Um, if it's not a fungus, then what's the point of the antifungal? So that's one issue. Second, they tend to be abused in areas that are dangerous to use steroids. So the, they were sort of marketed at some point for um, tinea cruris jock itch, and yet that's the classic place that you would get severe steroid atrophy. So no, you either it's either a fungus and you treat with an antifungal, or it's a steroid, um, it's an inflammatory disorder you treat with a steroid. Now, if you don't know, what do you do? You can do a fungal culture, so you could scrape it and look under the microscope. If you don't have that capacity, you can do a swab and send it to the lab. Um, but if you treat with a steroid, let's say you think it's a fungus, you think it's inflammatory and you're wrong. That happens to everybody, including dermatologists. You thought it was eczema, it ends up being tinea. If you put a steroid on something, it clearly worsens and then declares itself as a fungal. Okay, stop the steroid and give them an oral antifungal, but combo creams are no good um, for the reasons I just said. Okay. The last perioral rash we're going to talk about is perioral or perioroficial dermatitis. This um, is commonly misused, this term. People will kind of see lip lickers or any rash around the mouth and they're like, rash around mouth, that must be perioral dermatitis. No. Perioral dermatitis is a specific diagnosis. It has an unfortunately vague sounding name, but it's a variant of rosacea where you get this very um, specific kind of papulopustular eruption around the mouth and eyes. Um, this is a very robust case I'm showing you the pictures of, but it can be much more subtle. And um, it tends to occur either idiosyncratically in children, just for no reason, or in the use, if they've used topical or inhaled steroids. Um, and, you know, they usually actually spares right around the vermilion. In this child's case, it abups the vermilion, but it doesn't look at all. It's not eczematous at all. So it's not a contact dermatitis. You don't want to put more steroids on this. Um, and if you put more steroids on it, it's going to significantly worsen. So what you need to do is treat with topical um, anti-inflammatory medications. The classic one is metronidazole, which is FDA approved for rosacea, but used off label for perioral dermatitis. You can also use non-steroids like calcineurin inhibitors, but if it's severe like this, in particular in skin of color, it can be quite severe and recalcitrant. You end up needing oral antibiotics for quite some time. Like we're talking about a month, two months, three months, and maybe even longer. So they need to be seen back. I'm pausing just in case there's any questions. Um, I'm going to switch gears now to fungus. We had a little, we alluded to, you know, using antifungals. So it is really, really hard. The two hardest things in dermatology, people will tell you are tinea and um, scabies. They fool you all the time. And it's no harm, no foul. If we think something, you know, you make a mistake and you treat something fungal with steroids, it's fine. Just recognize it and stop and treat appropriately. So here's some examples of steroid treated tinea. So this child, Someone thought they had eczema, they treated her with topical steroids, but then she progressed and worsened and worsened and it wasn't recognized. And that is actually the mistake, not making the steroid in the first place, but not recognizing the error. So if you treat something you think is eczema, but then it starts to worsen and kind of expand in an annular fashion, serpiginous fashion, these scaly kind of rings and circles, and it marches outwards, that's tinea. Little bumps that march outwards, that's tinea. So you wanna suspect if you have a worsening rash in the setting of steroids that you're, you've missed fungus. Um, and anytime you treat uh, fungus with steroids, you have then led to the fact that they're going to need an oral antifungal. A topical will not work in this scenario. Here's another couple of examples, children treated for months with topical steroids, despite the fact that clearly it's worsening, clearly it's annular and it's marching outwards. And the center that's left behind are these hyperpigmented patches. That's not where the, the answer is. The answer's at that scaly edge. And if you have the, the capacity to do a KOH, a fungal preparation under the microscope, this would be teeming positive, very obvious. Um, this is actually a friend's child. I have permission to use this. She is a pediatrician herself. She texted me like, do you think this is ringworm? This is slam dunk ringworm. Um, and when it's this rapidly onset and inflammatory, it's usually from an animal source, such as a kitten, a rodent, um, guinea pigs are ubiquitous, are becoming a really bad source of fungus. And you can see this really inflammatory red plaque, that annular scaly border. This is tinea. When it's angry and aggressive like this, don't waste time with topicals. They need oral antifungals. 
Um, this is an example of a KOH prep. So if you are able to do these, you scrape the lesion, you put the scale under the microscope with potassium hydroxide, KOH, and you see these long, um, narrow branching hyphae, and that's classic uh, for a dermatophyte. Dermatophyte are the fungus that cause tinea. Oops, what did I do? Um, and then just please be aware that animals are, um, you know, there are more and more animal exposures with travel and just with pets. So the child on the left has a severe hemorrhagic carrion. A carrion is an inflammatory um, plaque of tinea where the body has made this severe inflammation reacting to the tinea and you get this hair loss. So she had a guinea pig exposure. We took us about six months to clear her and she still has permanent alopecia from this. Um, the child on the right actually was exposed to a horse in um, Laos and actually in another country because we have a lot of international families here in Washington, D.C. and came in with, again, classic tinea. We actually were able to culture it and speciate it and it came out to be this rare fungus, trichophyton equus, which comes from horses. So um, you really have to ask a really good history, just like we learned in, in medical school or, you know, um, our other nurse practitioner PAs who are on here, you know, we need to take a history um, to support what our suspicions are. Here's some other examples. So if you have a unilateral scaly plaque around the eye, think of tinea. These kids often get misdiagnosed because they people don't realize it can occur periocularly, but it definitely can, especially if it's studded with pustules like the child on the right, that should make you think tinea. Um, and then if you give steroids topically because you thought it was eczema, it worsens tinea. Um, tinea capitis, extremely common, primarily in children of color, African-American children, we think having to do with the hair morphology because it's not a socioeconomic issue. Um, but these kids can go years also being misdiagnosed or undertreated. So even fine powdery scale in a school-aged African-American child, highly suspicious for tinea capitis. You need to culture, make the diagnosis. Um, especially if you feel occipital or cervical lymphadenopathy. Your most common species is this one called trichophyton tonsurans, but depending on if you have immigration, you might have different species. Um, I really recommend culture because I have so many patients that come to me that are like, well, um, they treated for ringworm and didn't get better, so it's not that. And so usually it's like the steroid story, you were undertreated, the dosing was insufficient, or the drug just didn't work. So griseofulvin often fails which is why I typically use terbinafine or fluconazole. Um, but you need to treat with griseofulvin at, at least 20 milligrams per kilogram for at least eight weeks and check them back before you call it a failure. Um, so children will get like two weeks of treatment or one week or just get topicals. And topical medications don't treat um, tinea and hair bearing areas. You always need oral. So this is another child um, who had this for months and you can see there's alopecia, there's scale in the scalp and also massive lymphadenopathy, um, both cervical and occipital. So uh, strongly suspicious for tinea, you don't wait for your culture to treat, you treat empirically from that day. And there's no labs required for this kind of, um, for these drugs for the courses that we use. And why do we need to treat? Because if you don't treat it, the children will have permanent hair loss. So this child has permanent scarring alopecia because he was treated um, with an insufficient dose and insufficient courses of the medication. Okay, However, Corey, I'm, yeah, I'm go go on. Oh, no, you go ahead. No, 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 fine. Um, a question about tinea capitis versus alopecia, any pearls? Um, and when you say alopecia, do you mean alopecia areata? Um, I don't, I don't know. From okay. I'm assuming you mean alopecia areata. So alopecia, air, alopecia just means al hair loss. It's not a specific term. So alopecia areata, which um, is the most common non-scarring scarring hair loss in children presenting as um, usually coin shaped patches and then over time can extend. So alopecia areata ne is never scaly. There's never lymphadenopathy. There's never pustules. It, and so if you, um, it should really just be like a very smooth bald patch. Um, sometimes you might see uh, a little bit of pink salmon pink color in inflammatory alopecia, but never scale, never inflammation. And so if there's any scale at all, um, you want to culture. And the thing is, they really don't look alike at all. Like none of these pictures look like alopecia areata. This all looks like inflammation. Like this, this is a good example, this particular child. This is not what alopecia areata looks like. These are not bald patches. It's like patchy hair loss, but there's still some hair is preserved. It's scaly. It looks inflamed. Um, they really don't look similar. The only kind of mimicker of this tinea capitis picture here would be syphilis. Syphilitic alopecia can look like this, which unfortunately does happen in children, either congenitally or due to child abuse. So it's very rare. I don't 
think I would expect syphilitic alopecia in a child, but in an adult, you might. So if you have an adult with patchy hair loss and you've treated them, it's not ringworm, you want to get an RPR to rule out syphilis. But it really doesn't look like alopecia areata, which is smooth patches. Um, this condition often gets mistaken for tinea capitis, um, and I understand why, because it's scaly. It's all the things I said, and yet I'm telling you it's not. So the scale is a little bit different. So we call this pityriasis amniantaceae, where you get these more thick, yellow, waxy adherent scale. And this is really a variant of scalp psoriasis. Um, the parents will say, oh, the hairs fall out when I brush it. Um, and in this case, you wanna ask about a history of psoriasis. You could definitely swab for ringworm. It wouldn't be wrong um, because sometimes you can have concomitant ringworm. Often it's in children who are less likely to have tinea capitis, so white children, Asian children, so on. It doesn't mean they couldn't, but it's less likely. Um, and in this case, assuming you've ruled out tinea capitis, you need to get these scales to you know, disadhere. So you wanna use things like T-Sal, these products that kind of have salicylic acid to kind of um, chemically debride the scale, and then also a topical steroid within the scalp, a solution, you know, clobetazole solution, fluosinonide solution, et cetera, um, to kind of treat the inflammatory process that's causing the scaling in the first place. So I don't know that you'll see this commonly, but if you ever come across it, it's helpful to have seen a picture of it. Um, another tinea mimicker, so this is annular, but it is not scaly, this is not ringworm. So this is granuloma annulare, it's an idiopathic um, granulomatous disorder, basically, ball of white blood cells appears in the skin, nobody knows why. In children, it most commonly occurs on the dorsal hand or feet, and it looks just like this, this totally non-scaly kind of um, border to it. So this is not tinea. Um, this is a dermal process. The skin, the top layer of the skin is not involved at all. And you don't have to do anything, but it's more like you look like a hero because you can tell them what it is and you can reassure. Um, and it goes away on its own, but it takes several years. This one you're unlikely to see, but you don't want to miss because it is light, potentially life-threatening. So this was a child who had many months of um, this kind of violaceous eruption on the eyelids and on the hands um, with accompanying weakness. And he was treated as eczema and various things until he finally became so weak he ended up in the ER um, where they drew muscle enzymes and other things as part of the workup and he was diagnosed with dermatomyositis. Um, so if you ever have a child where there is weakness or, you know, you're doing a review of system, something just seems weird and they have something that looks like eczema, but it's in a weird place and they just don't seem right. You want to think about, are, am I missing a connective tissue disease? So connective tissue disease is pinkish purple. It's not just scaly. So if you see a kind of violaceous erythema and you're just getting something in your juju because you guys are so experienced, it's telling you something is weird, do a good review of systems and think about connective tissue disease because it can be scaly, um, both lupus and dermatomyositis can be, um, and then you wanna get a really good review of systems and do a workup. Um, and we could talk more about that in the comments time because there's not time to talk about uh, how to work up dermatomyositis, but it's just having an index of suspicion that something is off with the patient. All right, so this is another case. So this is a 14 year old. She comes to your office. This rash kind of erupted abruptly. She had a cold a few weeks ago, but feels better now. It's pretty itchy um, and want, so she wants treatment mostly because it's itchy and unsightly, but she feels well. What do you guys think the diagnosis could be? I see somebody said pityriasis, which is great. Um, I don't know if anyone else is commenting. I'm trying to click on different places here to see if I'm seeing everything. Pityriasis rosea, roseola. Good. Um, I'm seeing a bunch of PRs, which is the right answer. Good job. So pityriasis rosea is the correct answer. Um, and roseola would be a different population. So roseola, um, will kind of erupt after um, a high fever and be smaller pink macules, but it's the same kind of thought. So pityriasis in, in the sense that it's a post viral eruption. So pityriasis rosea, this is a really classic example with these oval shaped um, 
plaques that follow the skin lines. Uh, they can be small or large, as you can see here. In skin of color, they can have a violaceous hue to them, this purplish color that's still pityriasis rosea. We've been seeing quite a bit of it. It does have a seasonal um, variation, um, and it can also be triggered by COVID so that if, or the COVID vaccine. So if you see it in the setting of post-COVID or post-COVID vaccination, that is still PR. Um, and I wanted to show you some other examples here, that classic oval shape with that edge. Let's see, sorry, I have more pictures that are supposed to be coming up. Okay, the neck is a very good place to look because you can see that um, the, the fact that it's aligned along the skin lines very nicely there. Um, and then just as I mentioned to you, this can be triggered by different viruses, classically HHV6 and 7, which cause URIs, but nowadays we've seen it with COVID and vaccine. Um, the classically, it's supposed to have a hair old patch and then it erupts with the smaller lesions, but you absolutely don't have to have a hair old patch to still make the diagnosis. Um, and I'll just say, if somebody has something that looks like pityriasis rosea, but it persists beyond two to three, four months, you want to think about mimickers. So secondary syphilis can look like pityriasis rosea. Um, and so if you have a high risk population for syphilis, you want to test anybody with what looks like PR. Um, but also there are rarer derm diseases, pityriasis lichenoides, ones that we don't have time to go into. So if somebody has PR, but it's lasting three, four, five, six months, they need to see a dermatologist for a biopsy or you should do a punch biopsy um, if you have the capacity to do that. Um, and we could talk about mimickers if you're interested in that. But most cases, it'll just subside on its own in three to four months. Fourth case, so this is an adolescent. He came in mostly because he doesn't like the way these spots look. They're brown. They have a little bit of a powdery scale if he scratches them, but they're not symptomatic at all. Um, someone gave him topical steroids. They didn't work. Um, what do you guys think the diagnosis is? You guys are great. Tinea versicolor, tinea versicolor. Yes, that is correct. So this is tinea versicolor. Um, which we see a lot, but it's just nice to see examples of it. They also call it, we sometimes call it pityriasis just to indicate the fact that it's not actually a fungus, it's a yeast. Um, hold on, I think I have a bunch of nice pictures. So it's a reaction to a cutaneous yeast. You get this fine powdery scale if you stretch the skin or scratch it. it tends to be in the oily, sweaty areas of the chest and back. It can occur on the face in babies, so just keep that in mind. If you're like, wow, this looks like Versicolor, but it's the face and it's a baby, yes, that can happen. And I tend to use topical ketoconazole or oral fluconazole, both cheap and effective. Here's an example that's hypo instead of hyperpigmented, still tinea Versicolor. Here's an example of hyperpigmented, can be more extensive. Um, and here's an example on the face within a younger child. So it, you can imagine if you transpose this to the body, you'd be like, oh yeah, it's obviously tinea versicolor, but we get fooled a little bit when it's on the face. Okay, I'm doing my last section now, which is hemangiomas. I don't know if anyone wants to ask any questions about the last section or if we're good to keep going. Let's see some comments about molluscum and other things. Okay, so we'll talk about hemangiomas now. So this is a very important article. I encourage you guys to read it. It's from Pediatrics. It's a clinical practice guideline where a bunch of experts came together to give um, guidelines for the management of hemangiomas. So um, the first important point is what we're talking about are called infantile hemangiomas. So they are they have a specific life cycle. They are not present at birth. Even if the patient says they were there, you need to make them show you a picture they weren't there. Or if they were there, they were flat and they were a precursor lesion. They were not a grown tumor at birth. If something was a tumor, like the baby came out of the uterus and they had a tumor, that is not a hemangioma and they need to be evaluated in an expert center. But in the vast majority of cases, we're talking about infantile hemangiomas not present, grow rapidly in the first three months of life, and then involute. The issue with that life history is that the degree of involution has been overestimated in the past, and we really want to capture the kids who are not going to involute properly or who are going to have complications because we have an effective drug to treat them. So this table here, it's a little busy on a slide, but you can look it up um, for to scrutinize it closer. It's very important because it gives the guidelines on hemangiomas that are high risk that should be referred for treatment. So some of these things you know about, they're very obvious, like a hemangioma on the eye that could cause blindness, if it's on the lip and they can't eat, if it's ulcerated and causing pain. But there may be some you're not as com you know familiar with. So if a child has a more than two centimeter hemangioma anywhere, scalp or body, you still want to think about treatment because they will have potentially a very large 
fibro fatty residue. So as the hemangioma involutes, it actually just leaves behind the sack of baggy skin that's terribly disfiguring. So it's still worthy of treatment. Um, potentially, if it's a breast hemangioma in a female child because they can have um, lack of breast development there, or if it's something called a segmental hemangioma, and I am going to show you photos of these where it's occurring over a territory. So let's take a look at what um, what we're talking about. So periocular hemangioma. So this one was um, a child where you know, it didn't look too bad. There was this, these red vascular papules. And by the way, this is all one hemangioma. Sometimes people think, oh, these are like 10 together. No, this is all one. But this child actually ended up having a deep hemangioma below this that actually was causing um, amblyopia, causing pressure on the globe and eroding actually part of the socket due to the pressure. So that's not common, but it's just to say that any periocular hemangioma, we want to think about treatment. Um, and she did well with propranolol. This child came to me, she was probably two weeks old. She's been my patient for six years or so now, um, already horribly ulcerated, so already too late. Um, once you have an ulcer like this, you have a permanent scar. Uh, so we started propranolol in the clinic that day, and nevertheless, she still, even though she had a pretty good result, she had a, a scar there and she had baggy skin left behind. So you could see here, She's in the OR, you can see she's intubated. I put an eye shield in to treat her with laser, but this skin is not normal. So this is what happens when you, when the hemangiomas that are large and superficial involute, they leave this like mushy, baggy, what we call anidodermic skin, which is, you know, not cosmetically acceptable. And this is not a good place for the surgeon to excise. So the surgeons basically said, from a plastic surgery perspective, this is not a good option. So I did pulse dye laser and carbon dioxide laser to treat this and she had a good result, but it would have been better had she been referred to me really like immediately and we could have prevented this growth in the first place. Um, ears are an area that are also high risk. Any cartilaginous area, ears and nose, if you damage cartilage, you have permanent deformity. So the child on the left here, has an ulcer already at the lobule, which is a common location. And also she has what's called a segmental hemangioma. I alluded to that before, where it's occurring over a territory. So from many perspectives, she needs further workup for involvement of the, the CNS, but also she needs treatment. The kiddo on the right here, where it's much more a smaller hemangioma, but he was told, oh, it'll be fine. You don't need treatment. And now he's a year old and it's too late and he's gonna need surgery. So we could have avoided plastic surgery for him and damage to his cartilage if we'd treated him earlier. Now, sending kids when it looks like this is useless because at this point, the propranolol has, is not a magical wand, right? It can't just like shrink a huge sack of baggy skin. So once it's this big, the ship has sailed. So you really want to send them earlier. Here's another example. Like you can do propranolol. It obviously can't like magically shrink skin back into being normal. So um, we want to get these ch children earlier. So this child had an excision, so it has a large vertical scar down her entire forehead. Um, scalp hemangiomas, rarely but it is a possibility can have catastrophic bleeding i have never had a patient with this but my colleague has and there are published cases in the literature obviously this is an unusually large and scary looking hemangioma but still you know so if you have a scalp hemangioma that's large you want to treat it small ones will involute nicely and be covered by hair um now a place that i often see lack of referral are extra facial hemangiomas because people think, well, it's not their body, so it doesn't matter. I mean, it's not their face, so it's it's fine. It's actually not fine. So if you have a large hemangioma, that's especially the circumferential ones on the extremity, they are highly at risk for uh, both ulceration, but also that the skin will look really bad if you don't treat them. Um, very large ones on the trunk, you know, again, going to need a large surgery, but also they can even shunt blood and cause high output cardiac failure rarely. And the one on the right here, this neonate, um, we actually treated because we knew that even though it was um, the body was seven centimeters long and likely to leave a big um, area of anidoderma, and he's done well. Ulceration can be a really, really a beast once it's occurred. So this baby has a large segmental hemangioma on her buttock. By the time she came to us, she was already ulcerated. And despite propranolol, prednisone, and wound care, it took us three months to heal her, um, you know, with her mom suffering through all these diaper changes all that time. This child had um, an ulcerated lip hemangioma, and we actually needed to admit her for NG tube feeds and opioids because she couldn't eat due to pain. So we would have wanted to get her referred earlier, started on propranolol earlier to prevent the ulceration. And of course, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. Maybe we couldn't have prevented it, but we would like to at least have a chance to try. And this is how she's healed now. So she has a permanent scar, um, which is not too bad, but I am lasering her, her cutaneous lip here to try to get rid of this erythema to make her skin, you know, look her more normal, have a normal lip. 
And then even ones that are not problematic don't look good. So if you have a very large hemangioma on the body, you get what's called fibro fatty residue. The hemangioma cells convert into adipocytes. And you can see me squeezing it here to show you how much baggy skin there is, skin laxity. And, you know, plastic surgery, you know, can't just carve out a circle. So this is not an easy thing to fix. Um, I mentioned breast hemangiomas. We want to treat those because there are cases in the literature where the breast tissue never develops on that side if it's untreated. So if you have a large breast hemangioma, you can see here how it's deforming the breast. You want to treat that. Here's another example. And this is the case from the literature where this child had a hemangioma in infancy and then never developed breast tissue on the right. And yes, she can get a breast implant and so on, but we would have preferred to prevent that. Um, I often get asked, what about Timolol? Timolol is off-label for use in hemangiomas, um, but quite safe. It's used for glaucoma down to infancy, and it's an eye drop. You use it off-label on the hemangioma, not in the eye. And if you have a very small superficial hemangioma, it does work quite nicely, um, but there is systemic absorption, so you want to be careful not put like 10 drops on. But for small hemangiomas, I will use it occasionally. It definitely doesn't help for deep hemangiomas, so people will be referred to me at like nine months, and they'll say, well, they tried Timolol, but it's not going to help with a huge nodule on the scalp or body, so don't even try. Send them for propranolol or treat them yourself. Um, and here's an example where we did have a lar like a larger in terms of territory, but superficial hemangioma, those treated only with Timolol per parental request and actually did really well. So sometimes it does work, but I would say for the most part, it's not terribly effective when you really, really need it. But in superficial hemangiomas, it is a good option. And that is the end of my talk. I would welcome questions and you can definitely email me afterwards as well. Great. Dr. Kokorin, thank you so much for that great presentation. Um, wonderful case um, studies as well. If you could stop sharing your slides and then also um, if you wanted to turn your video back on, that would be wonderful. And we do have right. some- I didn't know it was off. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, <laughs> great. Okay, so, I do see um, some of these questions here. Um, Okay, maybe, just... maybe start with a, the first one, which is also the last one as well, just um, reframe how to do swapping and the last one. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to read the question. So how did you, how do you do rash or lesion swabs in primary care? Yeah, that is more of like a clinic management question than, um, than a me question. In most primary care offices, at least in my experience, you have swabs. Now the question is, can they do what you need? So we have a swab called an e-swab that can do fungal, bacterial, and herpes PCR from one swab. Um, but you would need to figure out, I mean, you must have at least the ability to do a bacterial culture. I would, it would be surprising if you didn't. Um, and most of those swabs can also be used. You just kind of take the swab, you put it in the medium, you rub it all over the scalp and then send it off for fungal culture. Um, some places do something called DTM where you just like, you have the medium yourself and you look for growth of fungus, but it's usually easier to just send it off to a lab. Um, if that isn't a possibility, that is, that is an issue. Um, but bacterial and fungal cultures are among the cheapest interventions in medicine and very, very helpful to guide therapy. Um, lab code, I don't have an answer for that. I don't bill for swabs. It's just part of the visit. Um, but you may be able to, I don't know, you would have to ask your practice manager. Um, I'm gonna skip molluscum since I didn't cover that in the talk, but I will come back to it if we have time. Um, so major side effects about Eucrisa, so the burning is the main one, which is not a side effect in the sense of dangerous to the child, but it's painful and the patients will be upset. So you want to treat, use it on um, skin that's not actively inflamed, but as a maintenance medication. Um, let's see here. Oral antifungal dosing, I mean, you got to use Hippocrates, obviously, because um, it depends on the antifungal, depends on the weight, and so on. Um, but general guidelines for griseofulvin, it's tw at least 25, 20 milligrams per kilogram um, of the 125 per 5 ml griseofulvin done for at least eight weeks. Terbinafine um, depends. So if it's between 20 to 40 kilograms, it's 125 milligrams, which is half a pill of the adult dose, which is 250. If it's greater than 40 kilograms, it's 250 milligrams. I'm saying this quickly because I really, it's important that you check your dosing every time you give a drug, obviously. But um, with terbinafine, the nice thing is that it's like $4 on these Walmart plans. So even people who are uninsured, it's quite a cheap drug to get. Um, be cautious in adults because it could cause liver inflammation in theory if they have a, you know, cirrhosis or something, but we're talking about children who don't. Um, and then fluconazole, it's six milligrams per kilogram for six weeks. 
Um, and the nice thing about fluconazole, it's FDA approved down to birth for candidiasis, so you could use it in infants. Um, and infants don't usually have tinea, but they can if the older siblings have it. Um, okay, let's see what else we got here. Uh, la, la, la. I'm just trying to figure out here. Am I missing? I, I saw a bunch more. Um, I think that there, Einstein, most but... of them were answered throughout. Um, and I think if you had time to just briefly oh, uh, touch on the molluscum and then somebody else. Yeah, I'll talk about molluscum and I'll, I see the onychomycosis. So the onychomycosis, yes, you need to diagnose it if it's a child. So if it's an adult, there have been plenty of studies that show that cost benefit is just to treat. Like in other words, you, you know what it looks like, you treat it. Um, uh, so if you have crumbly yellow thickened nails with tinea pedis in an adult, you assume it's onychomycosis, you treat. In a child though, it's very rare to have onychomycosis and especially before adolescence. So you wanna actually get the diagnosis. So I have many kids that were called onychomycosis that came to me and it was psoriasis or a genetic nail disorder or something called retronychia, all these other things. So for those I do confirm with a, a clipping or a culture. Um, but in an adult, go ahead and treat empirically. Uh, molluscum. Molluscum is very annoying, but not dangerous, and in most cases doesn't need treatment. That's the short answer. The long answer that there's all kinds of things you could do, freezing and, and all these um, topicals, but they don't have really good evidence. They're painful. So I never do painful procedures in children unless I have to. In other words, the child either needs to assent. If it's like a wart, for example, they need to be able to cooperate and want to do it. We don't hold them down and force them, um, one. And two, you know, we know molluscum will go away. So all the more reason not to do things that are painful and scare children. Um, but, you know, there is a product and that's where my conflict of interest comes in this Verica Pharmaceuticals. Verica is coming out with a product, which is cantharidin, the blister beetle juice, um, which people use off label now. It is not FDA approved for anything in the United States, but they are seeking FDA approval for use for molluscum. It'll be the first drug ever approved for that. So if they do get approval, then that would be an option. Um, it'll come in like a device with a little gentian violet in it. So it'll be purple and you would treat the molluscum. And in that case, since that is the only FDA approved drug, I think that would be reasonable to use if you're trained on it. Um, but for the most part, benign neglect is what we do for molluscum. Okay, wonderful. Dr. Kokorian, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us today. Um, this was just jam packed full of really important information for all of us to learn. Um, and we really appreciated, especially those case studies. A huge thank you to our attendees today for your participation. Um, and a huge thank you to Vaseline Healing Project for um, helping to create this series of um, six sessions learning about dermatology for all of the free and charitable clinics and some of our federally qualified health centers. A huge thank you to Direct Relief for being such a great partner. You can read about Direct Relief here. They're an amazing nonprofit humanitarian medical assistance organization. And if you want more information about becoming a Direct Relief partner, please reach out to Rose Levy and her um, email address is here. And then the Maven Project thanks you so much for um, being a part of this. We are a telehealth nonprofit and we're working to address social, racial, and economic inequities in healthcare. And we connect frontline safety net clinic providers like you with our expert physician volunteers who provide you medical advice, mentorship, and education through our telehealth platform. And we'd love to learn more about your clinic and, and tell you more about Maven Project. So you can reach out to Timmy Schrumpf and her email address is here as well. Um, please make sure to have your calendars marked for next two um, sessions. So we have another great Vaseline Healing Project presentation that's going to be on eczema on Friday, June 3rd, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern with Dr. Jeanette Okoye. And then a direct relief education session on a clinical approach to opioid addiction. That will be on Friday, July 15th also 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern with Dr. Timothy Fong. So we're really excited um, to be able to present these with all of you. So again, um, Dr. Kokorian, many thanks for your uh, sharing your time and your expertise with us today. And to all the providers out there, thank you for all you do for your patients. They're really lucky to have you. Thanks for being here. Take care. Thank you for having me. <laughs>